Hi students, it's Shayna, your teacher from EspressoEnglish.net. Welcome to our final Q&A live class. Um, thank you for your patience as I've gotten everything set up. And let me just do a couple of final checks. If you can hear me, uh, please tell me, say hello in the chat and tell me where you're from. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, the chat is over at EspressoEnglish.net slash live. So go there if you would like to interact. So I'm seeing some people from France, Costa Rica, Ukraine, Belgium, Italy. Okay, great. Thank you uh, for telling me you can hear me. Korea. Wonderful. Wow. Whoever's in Korea, you must be staying up very late to watch this because I know the it must be uh, like midnight around there. Okay. So today's uh, topic is Q&A on phrases. Let me pull up my notes here. Um, and some of you sent me phrases ahead of time, but uh, if you have a phrase you'd like to ask about, please put it in the chat and I might have time to answer it today or I might uh, save it for a future lesson. Okay, so let's see. All right, everything is good. Okay, let me get back to the chat page so that I can also see your uh, questions. Okay. All right, so phrases. Um, you know that I'm a, a big proponent of when you learn English to focus on learning phrases and not just individual words. Because when you just study individual words, it's hard to put them together into a phrase. But when you study phrases, then you can use the complete phrase in, in your speaking and it's much easier. But the problem with phrases is that sometimes you might hear or see a phrase that doesn't seem to make sense. Um, this happens with a lot of idioms and informal expressions. Uh, and you, you might just be completely confused by this phrase, especially if you see it in a movie or something like that, or you hear a native speaker say it. Uh, it, it can be confusing. And so that's why I asked you for questions about phrases. So I'm going to teach you a few of them today and I'll ask you sometimes to try to use this phrase in the chat or in the comments. So are you all ready to start? Our first phrase today is good grief. Good grief. That phrase or that expression seems really strange. Grief normally refers to uh, the, the feeling of being sad, like when someone dies. So why would you ever say good grief? Well, this is a perfect example of why you can't translate a lot of these expressions directly. Uh, you can't interpret them word by word. You need to learn them as a phrase, as an expression in context. So good grief, we use this as an exclamation for um, surprise or shock, uh, and often frustration, or to say like, that's ridiculous. So here's an example. Let's say you you are having a really bad morning. You you wake up late and then you try to make breakfast, but you, you accidentally burn your your breakfast um, and you know things are going wrong and your kids are fussy. And then when you go out to your car to go to work, you turn the key and your car won't start. And you might say, good grief, my car won't start. So uh, good grief is an expression of you're surprised, you're also frustrated and annoyed by this ridiculous situation. Uh, another good example of a ridiculous situation would be, let's say you work in an office and your manager comes up with some crazy rule. Like he says, um, in order to save paper, uh, you can't print more than 10 pages per week. And let's say your job needs a lot of things printed out. So when talking with your coworkers, you might say, good grief, that's such a ridiculous rule. Again, it's an expression of frustration, annoyance, or saying something is ridiculous. 
All right, so um, someone asked, is good grief equal to my goodness? Uh, it's similar. I think good grief is a little bit stronger. Uh, my goodness might be a little bit milder. Uh, but another similar expression is for goodness sake. Okay, and this is another one that you can't translate literally. And again, we use it for uh, shock, uh, ridiculousness. Uh, for example, if your son has been playing video games for the last six hours and you really want him to stop playing video games, you might say, turn off the video game. You've been playing for six hours, for goodness sake. Uh, it just adds, uh, it shows your annoyance or frustration with the situation. Or uh, if you're talking with a friend and that friend keeps interrupting you, uh, then you might say, stop interrupting me for goodness sake. Uh, so you can see how these are used just to add a little bit more emotion uh, to the uh, to the to the statement you're making. Okay, so uh, let me just catch up with the chat real quick. Uh, yes, so the timer on the site is at zero. You need to press press play on the video. Okay, uh, and. There are variations of, of this expression. Some people say, for Christ's sake. Uh, some people prefer not to use that because it's a little bit religious. Uh, it might offend people who are religious. But the expressions, good grief and for goodness sake, these are okay to use professionally. These are not offensive. They're they're very innocent uh, expressions of annoyance. So this these might be good expressions to use instead of swearing. Okay, um, you don't want to use bad language at work or um, or in a I don't know in an interview or something like that in a professional situation. But you can use good grief and for goodness sake. So someone put the example uh, in the chat. Good grief! I spilled coffee on my desk. Yeah, that's a perfect example of, ex of expressing annoyance or frustration with good grief. All right, let's move on to our next phrase, and that is to beat around the bush. This is an idiom, beat around the bush, and what it means is to avoid answering a question by talking kind of around the subject. Like you start talking about kind of related things, but you never directly address the main topic or the subject. And a great example of this is, um, I think politicians often use this strategy. Like a reporter asks a politician a question about, hey, uh, this scandal you're accused of, is it true? And maybe the politician doesn't want to give a direct answer. So he might start talking about all different aspects kind of around the topic, but he doesn't answer the question. That is called beating around the bush. And it's a technique to avoid answering a question, avoid giving a direct answer. Or if, uh, let's say, you come home and your kids have broken a window and you ask them what happened and they start talking about other things, you might tell them, stop beating around the bush and tell me what happened or stop beating around the bush and answer the question. So you can also say, stop beating around the bush if someone is uh, if someone is doing this and you really want a direct answer, someone put in the chat, stop beating around the bush, just get to the point. That's another good example of telling someone to stop doing it. Um, okay, our next expression. So someone uh, asked in the chat, are these phrases common throughout the USA or just in some states? Most of the phrases that I picked today are pretty common, I think, all over the United States. I didn't choose any phrases that are very uh, specific to a certain region, but of course there is going to be uh, some variation in some states or in some uh, regions. People might use these phrases a little bit more or a little bit less, but all of them are pretty common. All right, so our next expression is, what does it mean to steal someone's thunder? This is another kind of funny looking idiom. Uh, steal someone's thunder. So the literal meaning is to take someone else's idea and present it or use it as your own idea so that you get all the, the success and the credit and, and the praise for it. 
And this expression, to steal someone's thunder, came from a real situation. So it was back in, I think, the 16th or 17th century, and uh, it was in the world of theater. And one producer of theater, he made a machine that could imitate uh, the sound of thunder. So thunder is like when there's a storm, it's raining very hard, and you hear that <laughs> rumbling sound from the sky, that is thunder. Uh, so this, this producer created a machine that could make that noise so he could use it in his plays. And someone else took that idea and used it in their own plays. So the original inventor said, he stole my thunder. And then this phrase became used as a general expression for taking someone else's idea and using it first so that you get all the attention and credit. So a situation where this might come up is, let's say you're talking with your coworkers and uh, one of your coworkers comes up with a really great idea. Uh, but then you go to the boss and you present the idea like it was yours. You are stealing that person's thunder. And this is really considered not a nice thing to do uh, because you're trying to take all the uh, expressions. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to look at the chat and talk to you at the same time. You're trying to take all the credit for yourself. And actually, when I was researching this phrase a little more, um, so it's not quite the same as a copycat. Someone put a copycat in the chat. So copycat is when so someone else does something first and then you do it second. So if, let's say, your best friend buys a certain shirt and then afterwards you go out and you buy the same shirt, you are copying her. But to steal someone's thunder is actually to do it before the original person. And this phrase has even uh, broadened out a little bit more and is often used not just for taking ideas, but for doing anything big before uh, the other person can do it, or even um, just kind of more in general, taking attention away from someone. So a really good example is, let's say there's a wedding, so two people are getting married and they are having a celebration, and then one of the guests at the wedding uh, announces that she is pregnant, and so all the attention turns to her. So some people will say she stole th the thunder from the bride and groom because the the attention was supposed to be on the couple getting married, but this other person uh, stole their thunder. She kind of um, took all the attention away. In this situation, you could also use steal the spotlight. Okay, spotlight is like in the theater when you have a bright light on the main character. So to steal the spotlight means to take attention away from the main person and bring it to yourself. Uh, but sometimes steal someone's thunder is also used. Another good example that I found when I was looking it up uh, for steal someone's thunder is uh, when, uh, let's say, some company is going to launch a new cell phone and everyone's really excited about it and then another company launches uh, a, a new cell phone a week before and they kind of stole the thunder from the other company. So stealing someone's thunder is more used for ideas, doing something first. Stealing the spotlight is used more for attention uh, that you're trying to bring to yourself and take it away from the main person. Okay. Um, I know these are a little bit hard to understand the, uh, the the little details of them, but that's why it's that's why I'm giving you a lot of situations so you can understand it uh, in context. So, have you ever had someone steal your thunder? Have you ever had someone take your take credit for your ideas or do something first? Oh, here's another gr good example. Uh, let's say I'm planning a party and I'm going to invite all my friends and I plan my party for uh, November 4th and then someone else in my group of friends plans a big party and invites all the same people for November 3rd. She's stealing my thunder because she's taking that same idea of having a party and she's doing it first so that she can get all the people at her party and then probably no one will come to mine. Um, Okay, let's let's move on. Our next question is about the phrase, take something at face value. 
To take something at face value means to accept it exactly the way it appears without uh, investigating further. So here's an example. Let's say you have a teenage son and he he's driving your car and he crashes the car and he comes to you and he says, Mom, Dad, I was going to the supermarket and I got distracted and I crashed the car. If you take his story at face value, it means you believe exactly what he said and you don't investigate and look for other, um, you know, look, you don't think he's lying. You believe exactly what he said, that he was going to the store and he got distracted. If you don't take him, his story at face value, that would mean, hmm, I think that story is not true and maybe he was out partying and drinking with his friends instead. So to take something at face value uh, just means to believe it exactly as it appears and you don't think there's anything false about the story or the fact. Uh, a good example of not taking something at face value is things we read on the internet. Oftentimes we can't take them at face value. We can't believe them exactly as they appear because a lot of things on the internet are not true or they're not uh, properly uh, researched. So. Uh, if you trust someone, you would take their words at face value. Or you could also say you would take you take the person at their word. That means you believe what they say without suspecting any hidden motives or uh, false facts. And it is similar to the phrase, uh, uh, well, sort of similar to the phrase, give someone the benefit of the doubt. That also means to believe the person and not doubt what they are saying. All right, so this is, co this is cool. So just one phrase, take something at face value, meaning to accept it exactly the way it appears, uh, kind of generated two more phrases, to take someone at their word. So when you trust someone, you take what they say at face value or you take them at their word and uh, you give them the benefit of the doubt. In other words, uh, you don't doubt what they are saying. All right, uh, let's move on. Our next phrase is play it safe. Play it safe. And you might be wondering what the verb play has to do with safety. Are we playing a game or something? No, play it safe just means to proceed with caution. And you kind of take the more cautious and conservative way in order to avoid risks and problems. So a good example would be if I have a flight um, that leaves at seven o'clock and I need to be at the airport one hour before, so I need to be at the airport by six and it takes 30 minutes to get to the airport, well, technically I have to leave at 5.30, but to play it safe, I'm going to leave at five. And I want to leave earlier to play it safe because maybe there will be some traffic or maybe uh, some unexpected delay for some reason. So I want to take the more cautious approach and play it safe. Tell me in the chat if you prefer to take risks or if you prefer to play it safe. Personally, I definitely prefer to play it safe. Um, I like to have everything prepared. I like to allow for extra time. Um, I, I don't like to take a lot of risks. So I like to play it safe. What about, what about you? Do you prefer to, to play it safe? Or do you prefer to, what would be the opposite of play it safe? Uh, the opposite of play it safe, let me think of another phrase. Uh, you could say live dangerously. Um, that implies that you, you like to take risks like, um, uh, I don't know, maybe you do some radical sports or something like that. Uh, or living on the edge is another way to say that someone kind of lives uh, a little bit dangerously and they like to take risks. Um, and let me think, if, if you want to criticize someone who is taking a lot of risks, you could say that that person is reckless. 
Reckless means they don't think about things and they just go and do things regardless of the danger. Someone asked, uh, is it similar to it's better to be safe than sorry? Yes. Um, very, it's almost exactly the same. So I could also say in that, in that airport situation, uh, we should leave at five o'clock, uh, because better safe than sorry. We often use it's, we often use it as a shorter phrase, better safe than sorry, or, uh, okay, here's another example. Let's say my friend has, uh, some sort of minor health problem and I might tell him, well, you should still go to the doctor, better safe than sorry. That means it's better to be cautious and prevent problems than uh, have a worse problem later and then you'll be sorry that you didn't uh, see the doctor. Okay, so good examples, uh, play it safe and better safe than sorry. They have very similar meanings. Okay, looks like uh, most people in the chat uh, play it uh, play it safe, prefer to play it safe, prefer to get their homework done done early and leave early. Um, let's see. Rec is reckless an adjective? Yes, reckless is an adjective. So you can say uh, that person is reckless. He drives without wearing his seatbelt. That's a very reckless thing to do. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Our next phrase is a shot in the dark. Uh, a shot in the dark means when you try something, just it has a very little chance of succeeding, but you try it anyway. So think about, you know, a shot in the dark, think about shooting a gun. And if you are trying to shoot and hit a target, if you are doing this in the dark, it's very hard and it's very unlikely. It's probable that you won't succeed, but you, you might, I mean, there's a small chance. So, um, here's an example of a shot in the dark. Let's say my washing machine breaks and I don't know anything about washing machines. I don't know anything about mechanics. I might try to fix it myself, but it would really be a shot in the dark because I don't know anything about it, so I have very little chance of succeeding. Now, I might get lucky and my shot in the dark, my attempt to fix the washing machine might work and then I would, I would just be lucky. But a shot in the dark refers to an attempt or a try that has very little probability of succeeding. And uh, tell me if you have ever taken a shot in the dark. Have you ever done something that was very unlikely to succeed? Um, another good example might be if you're a student and your grades are, you know, so-so, your grades are average, and you apply to a university that has a really high standard, uh, that would be a shot in the dark. Uh, you, you, you try, but you probably won't succeed but you might get lucky. Uh, someone, someone put in the chat, in the chat, it's worth a shot. So it's worth a shot means it's good to try. Uh, and I would probably say to that student who has average grades and they're applying to a top university, it's worth a shot because you never know. Um, you might get accepted even though your grades are not at the standard. And if that student does get accepted, it will be very good for him or her. So it's worth a shot. Uh, someone put, what's the difference between in the dark and in the darkness? In general, nothing. They're the same. But for this expression, a shot in the dark, we always say in the dark and we don't usually say in the darkness. I've never heard it uh, that way. Um, okay. Uh, da, da, da. I'm just going to take a quick detour to answer one question because I think it's a common question. Someone wrote in the chat, when you go to see people whose loved one just died, what do you say uh, the next day? Um, this is a situation that is hard for everybody, both native English speakers and non-native English speakers. What do you say to someone who has just suffered uh, a big loss, the, the death of a family member, for example? And uh, one of the best things you can say is, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry for your loss. That's a good thing to say to someone whose loved one has died recently. Um, and 
you know, it's, 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 it's just a way to express your compassion. You feel sad that they feel sad and you are acknowledging that, that having a loved one die is a big loss. Okay. So, uh, let's keep going. I'm going to come back to that topic actually towards the end. Okay, so shot in the dark, uh, I've got a good example from, from my own life. Uh, at one point, my husband was looking for a job, but we, didn't, we were looking at the classified uh, section of the newspaper and we didn't see that many jobs. And so what he did was he applied to many companies even if they weren't advertising a job. It was a shot in the dark because we didn't know if there were any job openings. We just thought we would send the application and, and it was worth a shot. Um, but uh, he, and he, it ended up working. Uh, he did get a job even though one of those companies, uh, one of those companies was not advertising. Um, okay, let me check in here. Remember, a shot in the dark, shot is spelled S-H-O-T. It's, um, it's the noun form, okay? So the verb is shoot, and the, the noun form is a shot, S-H-O-T. Uh, getting back to the situation about someone who has died, a few people are asking in the chat about the phrase condolences. You can also say, my deepest condolences, uh, deepest condolences is better than best condolences. Okay, best condolences sounds strange. My deepest condolences or I'd like to express my condolences. I think these phrases that use condolences are more common in writing actually. So um, if, you, if you send the person a card, it would be more common to use this phrase, my deepest condolences. Uh, on the loss of your uh, father, for example, or sister. Um, but when speaking, you can say my deepest condolences, but I personally, I would say I'm so sorry for your loss. It's a little more, um, it's a little more informal when you're talking to the other person face to face. Okay, um, let's keep going. I'm sorry I'm jumping back and forth between topics here, but sometimes there's a little bit of a delay in the chat, so I want to make sure to address your questions as well as uh, continue with the lesson. Okay, here's another question. What does the expression mean, it speaks for itself? Uh, if something speaks for itself, it means it's obvious without needing any additional explanation. So let's say uh, you tell your friend something and she gets an angry expression on her face. And later, you, when talking about that, you can say, oh, I know she was mad. Even though she didn't say anything, you could say uh, the expression on her face spoke for itself. In other words, the, ex the angry expression on your friend's face made it clear, made it obvious that she was angry even without words or without explanation. Or another example would be, uh, let's say you're, you're part of a hiring committee at your job, so you're looking at um, candidates to hire for a job, and there's one candidate who doesn't have a college degree, but he has a lot of experience. And someone else on the committee is saying, well, I don't know, he, he doesn't have a degree. And you could say, but his experience speaks for itself. In other words, his experience makes it very obvious that he has the skills uh, without needing any additional explanation. All right, that's what it means for something to speak uh, for itself. That is different from the phrase, speak for yourself. Okay, so what I just explained about something being obvious is it speaks for itself. Her expression spoke for itself or his experience speaks for itself. If you tell someone speak for yourself, that means you disagree with their preference or their opinion. So let's say someone says, um, I love pineapple on my pizza. And if I respond, speak for yourself, that means you like pineapple on your pizza, but I don't, okay? 
Um, so you're disagreeing. You're saying the, that that person's opinion or preference um, does not apply to you. And this is a little bit, it's casual. So it, it could be a little bit rude if you, if you use it in a professional situation. So if your coworker says, um, I think we should do plan A, and you prefer to do plan B, don't say speak for yourself. It's just, it's a little too, um, it's a little too casual or a little too confrontational, I don't know, for the workplace. So in that case, to disagree, you should say, well, um, I think plan B might be better, okay? Uh, but among friends, you can use this expression, speak for yourself when disagreeing with or saying that the other person's preference or opinion is not the same as your preference or opinion, okay? All right, uh, I've got a couple more to do. Um, <clears throat> next we have the expression, with that being said, okay? With that being said. We use this uh, when you are going, okay, when your next sentence is going to contradict your previous sentence. So here's an example. Let's say you're looking for a new house. And so you're considering multiple houses. You're visiting multiple places to see which one you want to choose. Um, and then when you're making your decision, you might say, the first house we saw was a lot bigger. With that being said, I prefer the second one because it's in a better location. So in the first sentence, you were saying something good about the first house. The first house was bigger. And then you say, with that being said, so acknowledging what I just said about the first house, um, I actually prefer the second house. It serves the same function in the sentence as however or but. You could also say the first house was bigger, but I prefer the second one. Or the first house was bigger, however, I prefer the second one. Uh, so there's a contrast, there's a contradiction uh, between the first sentence and the second sentence, or the first part of the sentence and the second part. And so with that being said, um, or having said that is another way to, to express this, um, is just a way to acknowledge that there's a bit of a contradiction. This is a really good expression to, to use at work it, because it acknowledges, um, it acknowledges the previous point. So let's say uh, your coworker makes a proposal and you say, you don't just want to say no to the proposal because that might make the person feel bad. You know, they had an idea, they put a lot of work into developing a proposal and you don't just want to say uh, no. So you, you could say something like, your proposal is very detailed and well prepared. Having said that, or that being said, we just can't afford to implement it right now. So you're, you're saying something good about their proposal and then you transition the sentence, uh, having said that, or with that being said, um, into then the bad news that you, you can't implement the proposal, all right? Um, and there are, there are so many different ways to, to say this. Uh, someone wrote, even so, uh, that's another way to, to address a contradiction. So your proposal is very good, even so, uh, we can't afford to implement it. Okay, uh, moving on to the final phrase, and that is, been there, done that. Okay, been there, done that. It's, it's used uh, all together. And we use this to say that you've done something before or you've had an experience before. So let's say I'm talking about New Year's uh, plans with my friends and one friend says, hey, why don't we go to New York City for New Year's? Now, I went to New York City for New Year's many, many years ago. Um, I went to Times Square and I had to stand there for six hours because you need to get there really early. So if someone suggested, if my friend suggested going to New York City to Times Square for New Year's uh, Eve, I might say, uh, been there, done that, because I've already done it. Um, and I'm not really excited about doing it again. Uh, that that's this This phrase is a little bit flippant. You might not know the word flippant. Flippant means like 
casual and like you don't respect the seriousness of the situation. So it's good to use only in situations with um, with friends um, who, you know, they won't be offended that I'm rejecting their suggestion with been there, done that, you know, it, I, I have no interest in doing it again. So if, if your friend uh, tells you a situation that's kind of funny, like let's say your friend has young children and they're telling you a funny story about how their kids made a mess. And let's say you have older children, so you've experienced that phase of having young, very messy children. You might sympathize with them by saying, they, if they say my kids made a huge mess in the bathroom, you might say, oh, been there, done that, uh, with the smile to express the fact that you've been through the same kind of funny situation. But if your friend says, I'm really sad because my dog died, then you shouldn't say been there, done that, because it's kind of, it's flippant, it's kind of dismissive. It's really used for lighter situations, nothing so serious, okay? So if your friend's dog died, well, you could use that phrase I mentioned early, earlier in the lesson. You could say, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry to hear that. If you want to express in a more serious situation that you've had the same experience, uh, don't use been there, done that. You can say something like, um, I've been through that before and I know it's not easy. Or I've been in your shoes before. That's an expression that means I've been in the same situation and uh, it was a real struggle. It was very difficult. So those are more, those are better ways to express that you've, you've had the same uh, situation before without being flippant. Let me just spell flippant in the chat. It's F-L-I-P-P-A-N-T. And flippant means uh, not, not serious, just very casual. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So, I've seen a few more uh, questions and phrases in the chat, and I'm really sorry that I won't have time to answer them all. But I hope you can see from some of these examples how important it is to, to learn these phrases in context. Because if you just learn the dictionary definition of a phrase, you might not know these little details, like the fact that you really shouldn't use been there, done that for more serious things. Um, and then you might make a mistake when speaking English because you only learned the, the definition of the phrase and you didn't learn it in context. And so I really, that's why I encourage you to, um, to watch movies, to listen to conversations, and then to learn the phrases uh, within the context of a situation. And of course, if you have you know, questions about the phrase, to ask a native speaker about them and they can provide some clarification. So uh, if you want to learn more phrases and expressions in context, that's exactly why I created my Everyday English Speaking Courses because each one of those lessons is based on a conversation. So you'll read and listen to a conversation and then I'll teach you the phrases in that conversation and it makes it very easy to learn them because you learn them in, uh, in the context of that conversation and in the exact situation when they can be used. So if you'd like to... Um, if you'd like to learn more phrases and continue to develop your spoken English, I would highly encourage you to check out those courses. They're actually my most popular ones on Espresso English, and I think for good reason, because they are very practical, um, simple ways to learn new phrases. And there's two levels. Level one uh, focuses more on daily life situations, so um, traveling, shopping, socializing, interacting with other people, that kind of thing. And then level two focuses more on these kind of idiomatic expressions and phrasal verbs and uh, uh, informal expressions. And again, you still learn them in context. All right, so uh, if you're interested in that, you can click on the link under this uh, video or in the video description, or just go to EspressoEnglish.net and in the courses section, you will find the Everyday English Speaking course. One final thing I do want to say, someone asked in the chat, could you please suggest an online dictionary? I have two that I recommend. One is thefreedictionary.com 
And I like thefreedictionary.com because when you look up a word, um, you can, it has audio, so you can actually click on the little audio icons to hear it and then, of course, improve your, your comprehension, your pronunciation, and so on. And the other dictionary I like is called yourdictionary.com because when you look up a word in yourdictionary.com, there's also a link that says use it in a sentence and when you click on it, you can actually see examples of that word in various sentences and it really helps develop your understanding of the word because again, you see it in context. Now, the problem with dictionaries, of course, is that some dictionaries do include these phrases, but a lot of times they don't or um, it's, it's hard to learn phrases from a dictionary. So that's why I recommend learning phrases from a course like mine or from practice with uh, English speakers or watching movies um, and things like that. Okay, I'm going to finish up our live class. Uh, I wanna thank you for joining me today. I've really had fun interacting with you and responding to your questions, and I hope you've learned some new phrases today or new ways to use them. Now, this is our last live Q&A class uh, in the month of October. So in November, I'm going to be doing a different format. I will be doing Learn English from the News, which you some of you might remember from last year. I also did English in the News in November. And so some of those classes I might do live, some of them I'm, I'll probably just record and publish. Uh, but the best way to keep up with my lessons is of course to follow Espresso English on YouTube, Facebook, and by email. And that way you'll be sure that you don't miss any lessons. Okay? Uh, yeah, the, the 40, 45 minutes of this uh, lesson passed really fast, but they say time flies when you're having fun. So I hope you had fun. I know that I did, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.